Section thirty four of Reviews by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cricket. Reviews by Oscar Wilde. Edited by Robert Ross. Section thirty four. Mr. Simmons' History of the Renaissance. Pall Mall Gazette, November tenth. 1886. Mr. Simmons has at last finished his history of the Italian Renaissance. The two volumes just published deal with the intellectual and moral conditions in Italy during the seventy years of the sixteenth century which followed the coronation of Charles V at Bologna, an era to which Mr. Simmons gives the name of the Catholic Reaction, and they contain a most interesting and valuable account of the position of Spain in the Italian peninsula the conduct of the Tridentine Council, the specific organization of the Holy Office and the Company of Jesus, and the state of society upon which those forces were brought to bear. In his previous volumes, Mr. Simmons had regarded the past rather as a picture to be painted than as a problem to be solved. In these two last volumes, however, he shows a clearer appreciation of the office of history. The art of the picturesque chronicler is completed by something like the science of the true historian, the critical spirit begins to manifest itself, and life is not treated as a mere spectacle, but the laws of its evolution and progress are investigated also. We admit that the desire to represent life at all costs under dramatic conditions still accompanies Mr. Simmons, and that he hardly realizes that what seems romance to us was harsh reality to those who were engaged in it. Like most dramatists also, he is more interested in the psychological exceptions than in the general rule. He has something of Shakespeare's sovereign contempt of the masses. The people stir him very little, but he is fascinated by great personalities. Yet it is only fair to remember that the age itself was one of exaggerated individualism, and that literature had not yet become a mouthpiece for the utterances of humanity. Men appreciated the aristocracy of intellect, but with the democracy of suffering they had no sympathy. The cry from the brickfields had still to be heard. Mr. Simmons' style, too, has much improved. Here and there, it is true, we come across traces of the old manner, as in the apocalyptic vision of the seven devils that entered Italy with the Spaniard, and the description of the Inquisition as a Belial Moloch, a hideous idol whose face was blackened with soot from burning human flesh. Such a sentence also as, Over the dead sea of social putrefaction floated the sickening oil of Jesuitical hypocrisy, reminds us that rhetoric has not yet lost its charms for Mr. Simmons. Still, on the whole, the style shows far more reserve, balance, and sobriety than can be found in the earlier volumes, where violent antitheses forms the predominant characteristic, and accuracy is often sacrificed to an adjective. Amongst the most interesting chapters of the book are those on the Inquisition, on Sarpi, the great champion of the severance of church from state, and on Giordano Bruno. Indeed, the story of Bruno's life, from his visits to London and Oxford, his sojourn in Paris and wanderings through Germany, down to his betrayal at Venice and martyrdom at Rome, is most powerfully told, and the estimate of the value of his philosophy and the relation he holds to modern science is at once just and appreciative. The account also of Ignatius Loyola and the rise of the Society of Jesus is extremely interesting, though we cannot think that Mr. Simmons is very happy in his comparison of the Jesuits to fanatics laying stones upon a railway, or dynamiters blowing up an emperor or a corner of Westminster Hall. Such a judgment is harsh and crude in expression, and more suitable to the clamour of the Protestant Union than to the dignity of the true historian. Mr. Simmons, however, is rarely deliberately unfair, and there is no doubt that his work on the Catholic reaction is a most valuable contribution to modern history, so valuable, indeed, that in the account he gives of the Inquisition in Venice, it would be well worth his while to bring the picturesque fiction of the text into some harmony with the plain facts of the footnote. On the poetry of the sixteenth century, Mr. Simmons has, of course, a great deal to say, and on such subjects he always writes with ease, grace, and delicacy of perception. We admit that we weary sometimes of the continual application to literature of epithets appropriate to plastic and pictorial art, 
the conception of the unity of the arts is certainly of great value but in the present condition of criticism it seems to us that it would be more useful to emphasize the fact that each art has its separate method of expression the essay on tasso however is delightful reading and the position the poet holds towards modern music and modern sentiment is analyzed with much subtlety the essay on marino also is full of interest we have often wondered whether those who talk so glibly of euphuism and marinism in literature have ever read either euphues or the adon to the latter they can have no better guide than mr simmons whose description of the poem is most fascinating marino like many greater men has suffered much from his disciples but he himself was a master of graceful fancy and exquisite felicity of phrase not of course a great poet but certainly an artist in poetry and one to whom language is indebted even those conceits that Mr. Simmons feels bound to censure have something charming about them. The continual use of paraphrases is undoubtedly a grave fault in style, yet who but a pedant would really quarrel with such paraphrases as Sirena de Boschi for the Nightingale, or Il Novella Edimione for Galileo? From the poets Mr. Simmons passes to the painters, not those great artists of Florence and Venice of whom he has already written, but the eclectics of Bologna, the naturalists of Naples and Rome. This chapter is too polemical to be pleasant. The one on music is much better, and Mr. Simmons gives us a most interesting description of the gradual steps by which the Italian genius passed from poetry and painting to melody and song, till the whole of Europe thrilled with the marvel and mystery of this new language of the soul. Some small details should perhaps be noticed. It is hardly accurate, for instance, to say that Monteverdi's Orfeo was the first form of the recitative opera, as Perry's Daphne and Eurydice and Cavaliere's Rappresentazione preceded it by some years, and it is somewhat exaggerated to say that under the regime of the Commonwealth the national growth of English music received a check from which it never afterwards recovered, as it was with Cromwell's auspices that the first English opera was produced thirteen years before any opera was regularly established in Paris. The fact that England did not make such development in music as Italy and Germany did must be ascribed to other causes than the prevalence of Puritan opinion. These, however, are minor points. Mr. Simmons is to be warmly congratulated on the completion of his history of the Renaissance in Italy. It is a most wonderful monument of literary labour, and its value to the student of humanism cannot be doubted. We have often had occasion to differ from Mr. Simmons on questions of detail, and we have more than once felt it our duty to protest against the rhetoric and overemphasis of his style, but we fully recognize the importance of his work, and the impetus he has given to the study of one of the vital periods of the world's history. Mr. Simmons' learning has not made him a pedant, his culture has widened, not narrowed, his sympathies, and though he can hardly be called a great historian, yet he will always occupy a place in English literature as one of the remarkable men of letters of the nineteenth century. Citation Renaissance in Italy, The Catholic Reaction, in two parts, by John Eddington Simmons, Smith, Elder and Company. End of section 34, Mr. Simmons' History of the Renaissance.